The following program was produced by an independent community producer. The opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of the ECAT staff or board of directors. Once upon a time when I was a little kid, I discovered in our back attic a whole bunch of pamphlets that had pictures of the, of the World's Fair from 1893. And I didn't realize until I became a grown-up genealogist that my great-grandfather had actually attended. That's where he got all the pamphlets. So I've always been interested in the World's Fair. And the question... Sorry. Oh, yeah. You're, you're, you're actually earlier than usual. <laughs> That's right. Welcome. So um, I decided to do this presentation, and I guess the question you might be asking is, how can a fair 130 years ago have any connection to your lives today? But I bet you that you have done stuff that you wouldn't have been able to do except for the Chicago World's Fair. Now, you may not like it because it involves standing up. But can anybody tell me what the number one thing people in America still do that was sponsored by this 1893 World's Fair? Ferris wheels? Ferris wheels, uh, correct. The Ferris wheels we have today are nowhere near like the Ferris wheel you're going to see in this presentation. It was amazing. But no, that's not it. This is something most people do at least half a dozen times a year. And um, I bet you don't know. Let's get started. Let me... Press the magic. So it's the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance was invented. Uh, I said, well, you have to do. Most people say do the Pledge of Allegiance rather than say the Pledge of Allegiance. So um, the Pledge of Allegiance was actually invented by somebody whose name completely slips my mind, even though I looked it up half an hour ago. Uh, in 1885. But seven years later, this man, Francis Bellamy, who, by the way, patriotic people, was a socialist, uh, went to the President of the United States and said, hey, wouldn't this be great if we uh, put a flag in every classroom in the United States and um, had them learn a, a, a saying? And on October 21st, 1893, uh, over 20 million kids in America said the Pledge of Allegiance all on the same day. It's a little bit different from what we do now. It says, I pledge allegiance to my flag and to the republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And the other way they did it was with the Ron, uh, with the Ron DeSantis salute. That's the way they did it until, until Hitler came along. Uh, <laughs> and then everybody started to do this. But we'll be back to that. You just wait and see. What did they add under God? 1954. Oh, yeah. See, I remember the numbers. I don't remember the guy that invented it back in 1885. But I looked that up. That's the last change. The under God is uh, the last change. So there's a musical uh, uh, song associated with fair. Let me play it for you and see if it rings a bell. Let's see, see if we can hear it, too. Okay, yeah, you're just as old as I am. You should know this back in your deep memory banks. Uh, this song was sort of the theme song of the fair. It was a little risque. And five years later, when, uh, when we went to war against Spain, all the Civil War veterans said, geez, you know, Tarara Bumtie, and there's going to be a hot time in the old town tonight, are the great songs of that war. We had much better songs in the Civil War. And they lost 600,000 men. But anybody recognize that song? Think about your early youth. Think about this person. It's the theme song to Howdy Doody. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't quite the same lyrics, but it was him. Okay, so there's a couple of things, and here's a few more things that we can thank the fair for. 
All right, Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer claimed for a long time that they won the Blue Ribbon at the 1893 fair. They didn't, but uh, that's what they claimed. Cracker Jacks was invented as a snack for the, for the fair, and it's still going strong today. Vienna Sausages, the precursor of, uh, of hot dogs, which came along at the next World's Fair in 1904, were invented here, and they were 10 cents a piece, which is a buck 70 in today's money. That's not too bad. The other thing that was invented by a special recipe was the chocolate brownie. Now, the original recipe was so gooey and so messy that it was served frozen because you couldn't eat it otherwise. And, and what they did to make it palatable was they put apricot jam on the top. And that's, they sold thousands of these. So those are all things that uh, we're still familiar with. And there's more, as we'll see as we go through. So the one thing you probably should know um, already, or may have heard, there was a devil in the White City. You probably heard that. But we're not going to talk about any devil in the White City because he wasn't there. He was really six miles away in the city of Chicago, okay, uh, the, this multi-serial uh, killer, one of our first. Uh, what we have here is 660 acres of land that was landscaped by our very own Frederick Law Olmsted. You know, they named a school after him here. Uh, <laughs> who at the same time his company was working on this, which is the World's Fair grounds, uh, they were working on the landscaping for sheep pasture, okay? <laughs> so um, the amount of money they spent on the landscaping, um, and this is, not in Ameri this is not in today's money, this is in their money. So multiply this by 17 times and you can find out what it is in today's. Dredging to make the waterways, half a million dollars. Uh, Taking the dirt from those uh, dredge things and making the islands and flatlands out here uh, at, at Jackson Park, $450,000. And then putting the plants in and keeping them growing through the six months that the fair was in business, $350,000. So over a million dollars just to create the grounds. Okay? And everybody knew that this was going to be just a temporary thing. Okay? Um, so there was uh, 660 acres, 61 acres of water. Water was a big deal. 27 and a half million people attended. There were 14 great buildings and 200 other buildings of which, guess how many still exist today? It's a guess. You can't be wrong. 52? Nope. Four. One museum in Chicago uh, is, a, is a fairground uh, building, heavily redone. Uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. And then there are three buildings, uh, one in Minnesota, which we'll see, and two more here in New England, which I'll, I'll save for uh, a few minutes later. Um, there, the, there were 51 nations represented, 39 colonies, 47 states. Uh, the fairgrounds used more than three times the electricity of, of the city of Chicago at this time. And there were 120,000 light bulbs and 7,000 arc lights. Um, restaurants could serve 30,000 uh, people per hour. There were 3,000 water closets, 2,000 uh, 2, urinals, and 1,500 lavatories. Okay, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute too. The sewage system could treat 6 million gallons a day. What they were trying to do here for that six months was create a new city, the White City, which some people claim is not so ironic because uh, we have this issue of racism that we'll have to deal with as well. So how do we get to the fair? Well, one way was the six million. You get on a train, you shoot down there. But we're elegant people, so we're not going to do that. The way we would get to the World's Fair would be getting a ticket like this, and they were um, uh, $8.50. You'd want a ticket for the steamship, because that's what we're going to take. You'd want a ticket to the bathroom. Hey, the thing cost almost a billion dollars in today's money. They were going to get their money back any way you wanted. Now, you didn't have to pay to pee, okay? <laughs> However, if you wanted to wash your hands afterwards, <laughs> then you had to pay. Okay, so bathrooms were free, but if you wanted to have a lav if you wanted to use a lavatory, you had to have a ticket. All right. 
they had their own uh, intramural railroad uh, system. Uh, it was sort of like uh, uh, the L. Yeah, it was up, raised up above. We'll see some pictures of that later. And then the last thing, uh, you had to have a ticket for the vertical transit system, or as we call it today, the elevator. Uh, so you could walk up the stairs in any of these buildings, but if you wanted to use the elevator, you needed a ticket. All right? Because it took electricity to run. Hey, come on. Uh, so how did we get to the park? We would use this. This is uh, an entire steamship authority that was put together just to haul people to the fair. Uh, and um, they, could ha they could handle 100,000 people a day on this. It took 45 minutes, but they said the view was spectacular. You'd come along, and it, the, the city would raise out of the ocean, or the Lake Michigan. So it was very pretty. Now, the pier was um, uh, long. It was half a mile long. So if you didn't want to walk the length of the pier, you could sit on a chair and ride the uh, mobile sidewalk. This is, so that's the first one in America. Cost a dollar and seventy cents to uh, to ride. Hopefully, you brought some cash. So once you got off of that, there's your one ride ticket. Uh, once you got off of that, you would be going to uh, through the peristyle. And peristyle was this grand archway. Whoop. We want to definitely go through there. Yes. OK. We'd want to go through here. And it would tell you right away, gee, it's all white. All right? And it looks super duper impressive, like marble. Nope. What they did, because they had to make this thing from 1891 and open in 1893, this whole huge city, they made it out of something called staff. So what they would do is they'd put in an iron uh, framework and then mix plaster, cement, and actually marijuana. Um, <laughs> marijuana straw. You couldn't get the good stuff in those days. Uh, and that was what they would put on it. It was all made out of uh, like what we would spackle on walls today. The whole thing, statues, many statues, buildings, all were figured in, in this peristyle with all the detail was staff. Okay. The one drawback uh, to this is it burned like um, a torch. And uh, that's why there's only four buildings left, uh, only one of which was originally made in staff. Some of the smaller buildings were made in, uh, in wood. Okay. So you'd walk through here. Uh, the water running out here is the outflow of the, of the basin system that we're going to see. And on the top of this, for those of us who always ask, what about the Italians? That's Columbus up here on the top, okay? And there'll be Italians sneaking through here all the time. There's tons of Italians in this. Because it was a gigantic celebration of Christopher Columbus, who at that time was a hero. When we celebrated his uh, 500th anniversary in 1992, he wasn't so much of a hero. And nowadays, we don't even have a holiday named after him anymore. Imagine that, okay? Christopher Columbus, by the way, never drove a four-horse hitch standing up with two lovely ladies pointed, but um, the statue area here was very imaginative. So this is the Grand Basin. This is the heart of the fair. This is where you'd want to be. On the right-hand side is the Manufacturing and Arts Building. On the left-hand side is the uh, Agricultural Building. And I'm supposed to be making references to Easton. And um, one of the first references is on May 1st, 1893, governor, former Governor Ames wrote home to his wife uh, about his visit to the fair. She didn't attend um, because he was, on, he was on official business. He was part of Massachusetts' official delegation to check out how the fair was working. And he visited uh, manufacturing uh, industry and uh, agriculture and he said the Ferris wheel was the most amazing thing he'd ever seen. So, um, and as we'll see, he got some ideas that may have influenced, uh, again, our lives, particularly if we've been in Easton for a while. All right, so the Grand Basin was really great. There's a statue here. Uh, this was bronze with um, um, gilding over the top, 24 feet tall, on a base made out of staff that looked like marble. Uh, and it was done by uh, Daniel Chester French. Does anybody know about Daniel Chester French? He's much more famous for a memorial in Washington 
for a guy from Illinois. He, he's the guy that did the Lincoln Memorial. Okay. So he did this, and uh, we take a closer look here. And um, uh, it burned down in uh, August 1896. You have this made out of straw, and this is hollow. You can imagine what happened. It just went up like a torch and disappeared. Um, people liked the statue so much, they made a miniature version, which they put uh, in Jackson Park, which is the su successor area to uh, the thing. And uh, that lasted for quite a while. So um, we're uh, right next to the Arts and Manufacturers Building, which is something really big. Um, this is the west entrance, and it is uh, a huge building. It's 32 acres under, under roof. And many people are going to have objections to this, all the, everything here. One person will see, not only did he object, he said, well, Excuse me, I have an audience of ladies, so I can't say that. Uh, he said, bleep this, I'm going to do something totally different. But all these great buildings, except for his, were white. And they were done in classical revival style. Now, if you've ever walked in Easton, you know Richardson didn't do classic revival style. He did um, Romanesque revival, Richardson revival. And this is a, a change. This is a setback. Uh, this person, Louis Sullivan, will tell you, would have told you that this set American architecture back 40 years because all of a sudden everybody wanted to build these classical revival buildings. And they were, what a space waster. This is 32 acres, two, sto uh, two stories with a hole in the middle. So they don't even get a whole second, second floor out of this. Okay, so um, you may be familiar with this little building that just popped up. That's the long shop in Easton. That's 500 feet long, and to the best of my knowledge, it's the biggest building in Easton, unless you've been in the industrial park lately, and maybe they have a longer one there. 500 feet built in uh, 1850. The building that you're looking at here was 1,687 feet long, more than three times longer than that huge long building. This building was so long, they put a, they put a tunnel in the middle of it so you could walk through. You didn't have to walk all the way around. This one, it was just ginormous. Okay, it was so big that in the 31 acres, you can think 31 acres is a subdivision in Easton. They put in buildings inside this building that were as big as houses. Okay, and I'll show you in a sec. Okay, uh, it cost a million and a half dollars in their money, which is about 25 and a half million dollars uh, to build this thing, and um, it was probably the largest building in the world. Um, at that time until the Pentagon came along 50 years later. So let's take a look. Here's the inside. And this is why I say it's a wasted space. These are, the, these are the houses in here. And then there's all this empty space. And around the outside, there's the second floor. The first floor displayed all sorts of, of uh, artistically manufactured goods. We'll see it in a second. The second floor was a display of education. We'll see a little bit about that unless I took that slide out, which it looks like I did. But we'll still talk a little bit about that because I'm very proud of the educational display. Um, and um, here's what happens. What about the Italians? This is the, this is the Italian display over here. Okay. And um, everybody was showing off what made their country distinctive. So I thought the biggest contrast that I could see in the manufacturer's building was between the Italians, which were showing off all this elegant uh, uh, re uh, Victorian style um, uh, furniture. They had a very elegant uh, arched building. And then on the other side over here, this is the Russians. And look, this, this, this kind of reminds me of my house. I don't have a stuffed bear, but uh, stuff on the floor, you know, yeah, uh, stuff hanging down. The building on the outside looks pretty good, but not so pretty on the inside. A whole bunch of countries, Scandinavian countries, uh, colonies, uh, Japan, all had uh, exhibits here, and some businesses had it. This is the accursed Louis Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany has done, did the... Um, uh, fireplace uh, at um, the Gate Lodge, and he gets credit for Tiffany glass, 
which was actually invented by John Lafarge, who did the stained glass windows at the, uh, uh, at the Unity Church. But they had a huge display as well. The country of Austria, what do you think Austria displayed back in those days? What's Austria famous for today? See, I'm trying to be interactive. This is how, this is how I kept those high school kids off the cell phones. <laughs> Beer and sausages. They didn't, have that, well, uh, around the outside of all these great buildings, they had cafes and restaurants. But uh, if you wanted Vienna sausage, you had to go over to the, the Austrian village, which cost a dollar to get in. That's $17 in today's money. So they better have damn good sausages. You had to pay extra for that. No, uh, Austrian crystal. And the picture uh, of the Austrian exhibit is all crystal. I mean, uh, uh, an area twice as big as we're in now, just filled with you know, crystal vases, crystal chandeliers, crystal this, crystal that. They were very proud of that. Okay. It doesn't move unless I click on a little button. Oh, I cut out the educational section. Oh, trying to, just because I cut it out doesn't mean I'm not going to talk about it. So the, the second floor of the balcony had displays, incredibly boring displays, okay? So if you go to our historical society uh, and, and look in the display cases, they're pretty static and stuff like that. Those are even better than these educational displays, okay? Why? Because what you, how do you show off education? Well, books and papers under glass, which you can't flip the page. So you, oh, look. Uh, but I'm very proud of the fact that for Massachusetts, Harvard had a, dis had a little display, Massachusetts in Institute of Technology, and the Massachusetts Normal School, which is my alma mater, Bridgewater State University today, but that's, that's my school. They were there too. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I was impressed by the fact that the Normal School had such a reputation that it made it to the World's Fair. So that was good. What we're looking at here is across the basin, uh, not coming this way, but going that way. Uh, it, this is the electri electrical building, okay? And this is a statue of Benjamin Fla Franklin, luckily without his kite. And um, this building was done by Henry Van Brunt. And this sort of symbolizes what's wrong with the architecture of the White City. Uh, because Van Brunt used to be a very creative architect, and now he's doing this boring stuff. The, this Georgian Revival, Renaissance Revival stuff is all mathematical. You can read a book and says, you know, if you have five windows on this side, you have to have five windows on that side, and maybe an arch over the door, uh, and anybody can do it. It doesn't take any skill at all. But before that, he did this. Does anybody know where that is? You've all seen it. Come on. <coughs> it is an Easton. Yeah, I mean, it looks familiar, but I think. Yeah, cute. Yes, a winner. All right. This is the parsonage for Unity Church. It was done by uh, a firm called Ware and Von Brunt. Ware died. Von Brunt went to the Midwest and started to do those god awful white buildings. Instead of doing this, you know, really creative, this is a Queen Anne style house. It's one of the rare ones in Easton, and it's it's pretty beautiful. Uh, it's it, you're thrown off because the color picture would have given it away. Um, the the white picture um, takes all the all the Victorian color contrasts out. So here's an architect that built one of the buildings out there connected to Easton, and he betrayed the the spirit of Easton architecture. Terrible. So the electrical building, to my way of thinking, is one of the most important buildings at the fair. And we're there, I hope. Yes. So again, it's another gigantic building with um, all sorts of gigantic stuff. But it did, 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 excuse me, did have the advantage of multiple f exhibit floors. And if you look in the middle of it, you'll see something uh, uh, advertising a Tello autograph. 1893. A tele-autograph autograph is the ancestor of the fax machine. So it was already invented in 1893. And then there's this tower here. 
This tower is uh, 84 feet tall, and it has 18,000 light bulbs. All right, here's the easy question. Who invented the light bulb? Edison, correct. So this is the Edison display. All right. The thing about the 1893 World's Fair is it has already proven Edison to be loser because he was a proponent of direct current. Now, I flunked electrical shop in, in, in uh, seventh grade. That's why we moved to East, and the shame was terrible in French. <laughs> so we moved to East, and I never had to take electric again. But direct current was the, the thing that Edison was uh, proposing. A man named Nikola Tesla was propo and Westinghouse were proposing um, alternating current. And there was something in the late 1880s called the Current War. Edison was a, I can't say that here in a group of ladies either. Um, <laughs> He was not a nice man when it came to this, and he played dirty. He electrocuted an elephant. Um, yeah, that alternating current will kill you. Let, let me show you. Actually, it wasn't Edison. It was somebody he was paying, and he electrocuted dogs first. <coughs> so, oh, a dog's not the same as a person. Let's do an elephant. <coughs> and it was awful. Okay. Um, and so this went on for a while. And then some brilliant financiers like J.P. Morgan, who cares, bad nose, remember him? Awful. Great museum in New York called the Cloisters. He donated that to him, but man, he had a problem with his nose. Um, <laughs> and the other guy that was super duper important you may have actually heard of, Frederick Lothrop Ames. And in 1889, he got Edison to create General Electric. And then in 1892, right before the fair, he and the other financiers kind of took General Electric away from Edison and turned it into an alternating current thing. So when it came time to light the fair with those 120,000 light bulbs, alternating current, Edison had lost. There was a movie back in 1915 called The Current War, uh, and they have a scene that never took place of Westinghouse and Edison meeting right here in this area here. And uh, Edison says, well, you know, I lost, the, I lost the current war, but I've got an invention here that's going to make my name forever. And he was wrong about that, too, but not quite as wrong. Well, wait a second. Let's take a look at something everybody got to see. This is, this is Tesla's workshop, and they recreated Tesla's workshop, maybe. Tesla was crazy, by the way, just letting you know. So maybe this is his workshop, or maybe he had a really secret workshop stashed away someplace. But he was 100 years ahead of his time and nuts. Um, and in the middle here, there's this. And I won't ask you what that is, because nobody today knows what that is. That's the egg of Columbus. What about those Italians? Um, and this was his display to show the fantastic possibilities of um, alternating current. So here's the tower, 84 feet uh, tall, blah, blah, blah. Edison has lost, but he figures, oh, and I should go back, just quickly, he's surrounded. You know, he's got his 80 foot, 84 foot tall, you know, Sigmund Freud would say shortly after this, sometimes a cigar is only a cigar. Um, and that's what this is for Mr. Edison. But on either side, there's the General Electric display and the Westinghouse display. So he's surrounded by the people that actually won. But he had his special deal. Does anybody know what this is? Yeah, it's like a Nickelodeon. Uh, Nickelodeon. This is actually what... Um, I'm not, no, I'm just not going to go there. <laughs> um, so this is what uh, Edison called a kinetoscope, okay? And um, uh, it's the ancestor of the motion picture, he thinks. Uh, and the problem with it is you've got to stick your nose on the glass and, um, and, and watch the thing. And down below, this is the film, and the film goes over all these pulleys, and then it goes up and comes, comes down. Okay, not very practical, but it worked. Okay, uh, so this is the real innovation. 
but it's not really an invention. And one of the things that, that um, Edison does is he kind of gloms onto other people's ideas and then kind of refines them a little bit. And the idea of using film was a good one, but he hadn't got to the projection part yet. That's going to take him another couple of years, and somebody beat him to projected film, and we'll see that in a, in a, in a while. I do have to warn you that later on, this presentation gets to be R-rated. Okay. <laughs> All right, one of the things you'd want to do uh, after leaving the electrical building is take a, uh, a water transport across the Great Basin because at the opposite end from that big sculpture that we saw is the uh, McMono's um, fountain, the Columbian fountain, which is completely goofy. But it was the biggest fountain in the world at the time. Uh, it was 150 feet in, in diameter, and um, it was... Uh, the statues itself were up on a pedestal that were 12 feet tall that made a 12-foot waterfall. So you'd want to go by, and there was a lot of noise, and everybody either got in a gondola or a launch or whatever. Boats were big at the 1893. Every, every day there was a parade of boats, and all the guys that um, you know, took people on rides would get in this parade and go all over the place. But the fountain was spectacular, even though it is goofy. So these are, uh, these are the seahorses of commerce. Everything had a, was a symbol. The, the seahorses of commerce are attached to the barge of state, which is being hauled through the fountain. And because you can never trust seahorses, you, uh, you had the muses pushing the oar. So you're looking at the muses of arts, music, architecture, sculpture, and painting. Okay. Is there five there? There's four. It's the arts, music, architecture, sculpture, and painting. Okay. This, uh, this sculpture cost $816,000 in today's money. Okay. Sitting on the barge at the top is uh, Columbia holding a torch, just like she does in you know, the Columbia movie you know, entrance. Uh, in front is um, somebody. Uh, let's see. Um, and I didn't write that down. It is somebody. And in the back, the, oh, um, yeah, I can't get that one. What? So at the back, the, uh, you know, at my age, I identify, I identify much more with the guy in the back. That's time. And you know the guy with the, the scythe? So in this particular case, just to help out, he turned his scythe into a rudder for the ship of state. And that's what the symbolism for this damn thing is supposed to be, okay? Yeah, it's nuts. And the whole, the whole kind of behind, the, the, the whole philosophy behind this fair is nuts. But, yeah, that's the way it is, okay? Speaking of nuts, this is the, uh, this is the agricultural building. It was designed by Stanford White. Does anybody know uh, what Stanford White decide, designed in Easton? You've all seen it. Well, maybe not. Every one of you who can read has probably seen it. Hint. The library. The library. Yes, genius. All right. Okay. And usually that doesn't happen with somebody at the back of the class. Uh, so the person at the back of the class usually says, just nuke them. That's, you know, solution to everything. Just nuke them. I heard it a million times in my 40 years of teaching. But yes, it's the library, the library, the library. The big fireplace in the reading room designed by Stanford White. Probably the uh, animals around the outside of the library also designed by Stanford White. The library was his last gig with Richardson. Uh, and then he went off and formed a company with uh, Charles McKim and somebody else. Stanford, uh, ch 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 cheating, cheating, Mead. Okay, uh, Boston Public Library is his design. Ma the original Madison Square Garden, of sad, sad repute for him, um, was um, um, his design, and he had a belt. He had a, like a penthouse apartment, and he had a swing in that penthouse apartment, and he liked to see young girls swing on that. I told you it's going to get out right. Swing on the swing, and then one day. He invited up a, a girl who had a husband, and the husband didn't take well to this and shot Mr. White dead. Okay. 
And the guy got off, he pleaded insanity. Oh, good for him. So uh, this, uh, this building, the agriculture building, cost $10 million uh, in today's money. And it had this goofy stuff on the side. Let me show you. This is the bridge that crosses over. And I'll just point to the goofy stuff. Here, there's a close-up coming. Look at this. What the heck is that? What purpose does that serve? None is the answer. It didn't serve any purpose for the ancient Romans, but um, I'm glad that the ancient Romans did this. Uh, I'll show you. It is a rostral column. Now, the Romans won a battle, a naval battle. The Romans were awful as naval people, so they were fighting the Carthaginians who were really good with boats. So the Romans built a bunch of boats, put a bunch of army guys on them, crashed into the Carthaginian boats, jumped on the boats, and won the battle. So when they got home, they took the prow of one of the ships, called a rostrum, and stuck it up in the forum. And forevermore, that's where you would speak um, if you were a Roman orator, or if somebody like me who's now speaking from a rostrum right here. So these were rostral columns used in the ancient world to celebrate naval victories. So they even though we haven't had any naval victories yet, you know, we haven't become imperialistic, we put six of these things at the World's Fair with the little beaky things. These are the edges of the ships here. And that's Neptune up the top, all right? Completely useless. Inside the agricultural building was really weird. Uh, almost every state, including the state of New Hampshire, uh, put in um, uh, stuff made out of their agricultural things. Over here in the corner, you have a plow that was used by Daniel Webster. That's really impressive for New Hampshire, considering he moved to Marshfield and never went back. Um, but if you went out to states that had real agriculture, uh, you'd find um, Ontario, Canada had a tremendous display of potatoes, which is still a staple thing in there. Uh, Oklahoma had all sorts of corn husks, and they made weird things out of it. I mean, like the map of the United States made out of corn husks and seeds. Like, it was like the Rose Parade, which is just getting started at this time. Uh, and then this is Pennsylvania, who really went crazy. These are all ears of corn in the middle. Yeah. And multicolors, though. It was good. So you had all the state exhibits of farmy stuff. And Oliver Ames went to this and said, hey, this was really cool. He liked this one. He liked the manufacturers, as you might expect. He's Oliver Ames. Um, even he was just a, you know, the governor, the governor. Uh, just like in the other buildings, there were commercial things. If you look real closely, you might be able to tell me whose exhibit this is, because they haven't changed the bottle. See these? We had a, we had a state, we had a, a senator who's now a diplomat, whose wife, no, wait a second, yes. Uh, yeah. Heinz. This is the Heinz exhibit. Those are the ketchup bottles. Okay. And they were just getting into things and they were promoting. Okay. They were promoting everything. And if you really wanted to impress your wife, you could get her a charm at the Heinz booth of a pickle. Okay. You could also use this as a watch for as well. Um, or as one of those Italian horn thingies. No, either way. Okay. What about those Italians? Also in this building, somebody who was famous and who no longer is because she wasn't politically correct. It's Aunt Jemima. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Aunt Jemima uh, pancake flour was the first ready-made product in the United States. You know, you add milk and you make a pancake. Before that, you had to mix up the baking soda and the flour and stuff like that. They also hired a woman named uh, Nancy Green, who was uh, actually the first black advertising model. This wasn't her only gig. Uh, it, unfortunately, what happened was, oh, yeah, just like Mammy, you know, uh, that's what old, old fat black ladies did was they, they cooked for the white folks. And that sort of represented what was wrong with the World's Fair. Okay, and I'll show you here uh, on this next slide. So um, 
Frederick Douglass, who I'm sure you heard about, and Ida B. Wells, which was, uh, would ultimately be a black suffragette. Remember that wonderful suffragette parade in Washington, D.C.? All the white girls parading down the stage. And at the, the back of the parade, all the black girls parading. Yeah. That was Ida B. Wells. So uh, Frederick Douglass uh, was probably the most prominent black American at the time. He was going to live another two years. And they wrote this pamphlet called The Reason Why the Colored American is Not <laughs> in the uh, World's Columbian Exposition. You don't know how hard I tried to get my mother to not say colored people. Um, <laughs> and my mother always claimed that she was, a, she was a pioneer in civil rights because she shared a locker with a girl at Bridgewater State who turned out to be black. Okay. <laughs> and the most amazing thing is, 100 years afterwards, there was a little article in the alumni magazine for Bridgewater saying, our, our oldest alum is this lady. It was my my mother's friend, but she was a civil rights worker, even though she never learned to say black <laughs> or African American. That was, that's beyond me. Uh, but the colored American was not at the fair because A, number one, they didn't have any representation on the, on the commission. What happened was all these white people set up the commission and they didn't think about including any minorities at all. And then they finally said, yeah, well, wait a second. There's a lot of black folk here in Chicago now because they're coming up from down south. And so we'll put a guy, uh, we'll put a guy on, the, on the commission. We just won't give him anything to do, but there he is. You know, and he's in the pictures. Well, he quit very, very rapidly. African Americans by this time, they were having a good 30 years. After, after slavery was over, lots of people got educated really fast. And a lot of the inventions that were used at the, uh, at the fair, like the uh, safety mechanism for the elevators, were invented by black inventors. But this is also the era of Jim Crow, separate but equal, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's the era of lynchings. It's a really bad time. It's, uh, it's generally called now the nadar of, Afri uh, of um, American race relations. A couple of thousand people were lynched, men, women, and children. So this was a really bad time. And the other problem that uh, uh, American Af uh, African Americans had was there were displays of, uh, of folks, folks from Africa who were advertised as cannibals. Yep, there they are. Those are the, these are the wonderful folks in the black and white up here from the French colony of Dahomey. And if you're into National Geographic photos, well, there's a lady that has no. um, topless. Shh. I told you it was going to get irate topless. <laughs> OK, so they had this reputation of being a little uncivilized. And to many Americans, that was a representative of all black people. I'll show you in a second. In reality, the people from Dahomey were very nice people. Here's one that actually uh, liked America so much that they, they uh, made it one of their uh, robes out of an American flag. Okay. And they were very nice people, and if you talked to them, they were, they were very interesting. However, to make things up to um, all the people that were um, colored, uh, the fair decided to have an African American day. And this is how it was reported in the, uh, the British newspaper um, Puck. Okay, so it's Darkies Day at the fair. There, there's the word that came before. Uh, and here's your watermelon. I, I've heard that lately uh, from somebody, yeah, who's not going to lunch with us today. And uh, you can see the stereotypical things. And these, you know, these are here's here's the American folks, and here's the cannibals over here. Uh, but that's that's the way it was completely and totally prejudiced. So the question that scholars are still debating today is, was this 1893 thing really good or was it really bad? And the answer is kind of ambiguous. It's kind of typically good and bad. And I'll show you why as we go through. But we've got about 10 more minutes to go and if I'm really fast, we can do it. <laughs> All right, this is the uh, machinery building. It was done by Peabody and Stearns, which is a famous architectural company. And this is where the, uh, the Ames shovel uh, exhibit was. And um, the text here was done by um, Google, Google Bard, it's artificial intelligence. I had to look it up. It was 
it was hard to find this information. There's no pictures. Um, nobody at the fair won a, a gold medal. So the fact that this medal here, which was the one that was donated to the Ameses, uh, is bronze doesn't mean they won third prize. They, they won first price, prize for hand tools. Okay? And this is what they displayed, shovels, including the Ames number one shovel, which you can see today at the Stonehill Shovel Museum, uh, uh, and rakes, hoes, and other hand tools. Uh, a model of the shovel factory in Easton, which I would love to have. I don't know where that, what happened to that one. A display of all the different materials that we used to make the shovels. And the Ames exhibit was a major success at the exposition, and they helped to solidify the company's reputation as the leading manufacturer of hand tools in America. So we were there. That's why the governor liked the manufacturer's building. Uh, the manufacturer's building was also very special because like a lot of these great buildings, they had a multiple purpose. And in the basement, that's where the boilers were for the entire 600 acres of the, uh, of the thing. And there were uh, electric wires, not on poles like they are here in Easton, but in tunnels going all over the fairgrounds, lighting everything up. So there was a tunnel, there was a boiler room, and then out where the public could see it easily, you could visit the boiler room if you wanted to, was this huge belt Okay, and the belt was powered by the boilers turning a steam turbine, which turned a generator to produce alternating current, which was then sent out to all the things. And this was one of the wonders of the, of the fair because the belt was six feet wide. It was huge, okay. And to show you just how huge that is, this is, the, this is the exact same thing at the shovel works. This is the power center there. The one at the World's Fair generated 12,000 horsepower. And this ran the entire shovel works out of this little room. It's still there. You can see this. And the, and the belt that we just saw, the tiny version of the belt, which 50 years before was newsworthy, uh, was in this building. So everything was there. Again, that's why the governor liked it so much. So... Again, you know, the white city, blah, blah, blah. And that's setting architecture back 50 years because here's what people could do if they actually spent some time thinking about it. This is the transportation building designed by uh, Adler and Sullivan. Adler was a student of H.H. H. Richardson, and Sullivan was the architect most influenced by Richardson's style. You may have seen this before. Again, if you're a reader, there's one of them right there in front of the library. Uh, and this, a few on the Oaks Ames Memorial Hall. This is the transportation building, and the Golden Door was one of the famous and most controversial parts of the entire fair. Okay. Oh, and there's some uh, animal sculptures. They had a lot of animal sculptures. There's bulls and things, and those are elk. And people got to be famous because of that. Uh, the transportation building actually was relatively inexpensive. It only cost $370,000 in their money multiplied by 17, so that's about 1.2 million, okay? It was a double duty building. This is the, uh, this is the um, L, the elevated railroad that went around the outside of the park, and it actually ran through the transportation building. So that was one of their stations. And the hookups for the Regular rail lines from downtown Chicago were at the back of the transportation building. So unlike these other buildings, which tended to be square, these were uh, the transportation building was long and skinny. Okay. So there's your L. And here's what you have. You have H.H. H. Richardson. Here's our little arch at the library. You have um, Louis Sullivan over here. And and then you have over here, Louis Sullivan's uh, student. Does anybody know who he is? You might have heard of him. Frank Lloyd Wright. Okay. So this is why when people tell you that, oh, Richardson's the father of modern American architecture, and you look at the buildings and say, geez, they kind of look a little old-fashioned. This is the, the pedigree that leads to here. And Frank Lloyd Wright is definitely the father of modern American architecture. So here's the close-up of the Golden Door in, in black and white. This is artificial intelligence colorization. Ooh. And then this one is a, a close-up. And this is actually a picture of the thing. It was an extraordinarily beautiful building. Very original. And you weren't going to see its like for another 50 years in America. It's very sad. Louis Sullivan eventually um, was successful because he became the first big designer of skyscrapers. 
And there it is, looking over the pond. Okay, this is the wooden wooden. Blah, this is the wooded island, which was the heart of uh, Olmsted's design. And this is where uh, you know he designed Central Park, and every big city needs to have a park in the middle of it. Here it is. So uh, this is the wooded island. And the most important thing on the wooded island was this, which is one of the things. All the bushes had these little tinkly little Christmas tree lights, and at night they turned them on. And it was beautiful. Okay. That's the administration building in the background over there. It also had the uh, Japanese Ho-Oden, which I have no idea what Ho-Oden means, but it was an uh, exhibit of Japanese culture. And uh, it was extraordinary. It burned down among the first of the buildings to burn down. Uh, and there are no pictures of the interior, which is tragic. Um, the Japanese also had a uh, display. They had a, a, a store over on the uh, Midway, uh, which there are pictures of the interior there. And it looks like a crowded Ocean State job lot is what it, you know, with good looking Japanese stuff in there. Ho, H O O, hyphen O, hyphen D E N, Ho O Den. Don't forget, it, it's Americans pretending to, you know, we're not good at this. So uh, on the wooded island, this uh, is looking at the next building we're going to quickly visit. That's the horticultural building, the gardening uh, center. So that's another example of showing off some uh, agricultural things. Uh, there's the building. And, you know, the, the giant squash from Ontario uh, and the display from California of the Liberty Bell in oranges. They, I, I'm sure they had to keep replacing the oranges over the six months of the thing. And then in the middle was this gigantic dome that puts you in the, whoop, that puts you in the middle of a tropical, a tropical jungle. And there was a cafe around the outside, so you could, you know, uh, like many of these buildings, they had pretty special places where you could eat, and this was, this was one of them. And here you see the people enjoying tea or waiting to be served or trying to get this obnoxious stranger to go away, um, one or the other. So in the next building, we're going to take a quick look at. Whoop, I'm going backwards. Let me go forwards. Is this one. This is my favorite of the white buildings. Uh, and... Guess what? It wasn't just African Americans that got cheated and prejudiced against. There was this other part of the population called women. You may have heard of them. Uh, and uh, they were kind of left out of the fair. There was a, the fair's organizer's wife was sort of in charge of the women. So that's why we had brownies. Uh, but they decided to uh, give women a little bit more than, than black people. They had a building, the women's building. They had a competition. Ha, ha, ha. We'll have women architects to have a competition to build the building. There were like three in the country. Um, and this woman here, come on, Sophia. You can do it. There we are. So this is uh, Sophia Hyden, and she's from Boston. Um, and very special. I don't mention this very much. Her mom was... Uh, uh, a Latina. She was either from Cuba or from, um, uh, from Mexico. So whew, we have a Latina person here. Uh, she designed this building. I think it's extraordinary. It's beautiful compared to the other white buildings were, which were excessive and you know, kind of clunky. The women organizers of the fair and the male architects who were also running the fair gave her such a hard time she never designed another building. Okay. Uh, and she was only in her 20s at the time. She came back to Boston and lived out her life, and that was kind of it. The inside, the, the, the saying was, a woman could spend all day in the woman's exhibit. A man could spend five minutes and then go over to the Midway and find out what Little Egypt could do. Okay, and we'll find out about Little Egypt in a few minutes. So um, Governor Ames doesn't mention going to the ladies' exhibit, but I think he did because this next slide, this is the, the Kitchen of Tomorrow, uh, which was in the women's building. And there, there somewhere, and I couldn't find it, there's an uh, exact 
picture of his uh, redesign of the house that was torn down before the house that was just torn down was torn down. Um, and he had a kitchen of tomorrow in there. It looks exactly the same as this, except for it doesn't have the fly screens because we don't have flies in Easton. Okay, so um, they, they displayed all sorts of stuff like this, but also paintings by women, writings by women. It was really something anybody could afford to go and take a look at um, for the whole day, as much of these examples were. People spent a week at the fair just trying to see everything. So uh, also included, which was really cool, was a tea room, because women like tea, of course, um, I guess. So uh, it was a Salon tea. You might as well get the best. So uh, the country of Salon, which is now Sri Lanka, um, had this tea room. And the uh, lady that ran it, this is her here, was so articulate and so kindly that she became one of the big hits of the fair. Oh, you have to go to the women's display and see this lady because she's so wonderful. I just want to point out for some people here that Ceylon is really like India South. So just letting you know. Okay. So, after you leave the woman's uh, uh, exhibit, the th next thing you would go to would be the state buildings. And so, this is the state of Maine building. Each of the states generally put some exhibit about their state and then had spaces where if you came from the state of Maine and wanted to sit down and you didn't want to buy a ticket to sit down, you could go to your state's thing. So, the reason that this gets two whole pictures is that... Uh, this building still exists. It's one of the four. Has anybody ever visited here? Okay. You have drunk stuff from the springs at Poland Springs, and that's where that is. Yep. Okay. So the next thing is this building here. This is in Brookline. It's an apartment building now, but it was a Dutch chocolate company building at the fair, and they moved it to Brookline. I don't know why. <laughs> they moved it to Brookline, and it's still there today. And that's kind of interesting. That's a more Richardsonian style than most of the buildings. And here's the state of Massachusetts building, which I have to say, of all the pictures I've looked at of the insides of state buildings, the most boring. Okay, sorry. You know, here's, the, here's three floors. These documents and things in the, you know, I think we have a display case like that at the Historical Society. Uh, had stuff from the Revolution and from the Pilgrims and stuff like that. I suppose you could go and say, ah, isn't that wonderful? But mostly it was a place for meetings. There were over 7,000 meetings, uh, excuse me, over 7,000 speeches given at the fair, all sorts of conferences, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be a meeting room. This is somebody's thing. It's um, maybe John Hancock's. The building uh, is modeled after the John Hancock House, which by this time, 1893, was torn down in Boston, but they knew what it looked like. And this is the, uh, now we're moving from states of, you know, this is not New York, no, it's not. Uh, this is uh, the India building. India was a colony of England at the time, and if you look up above, you can see the guys that were in charge of the show, those English people. And then down below, you can see uh, people from India, the folks that run our stores today. Um, and there it is in color. Very busy, very typical of what an Indian bazaar would look like uh, back in the day. Next, we have two buildings here. One, I'm sure, is close to several people in Harris Art. This is the Swedish building. It was, uh, it was built in Sweden, chopped up into three parts, brought to Chicago, and assembled. I don't know how they did that. They must have had a big ship. The, by the way, the, the Scandinavians were pissed. Did I say? Oh, I shouldn't say that. Uh, because, you know, Columbus didn't discover America. It was Leif Erikson. So the people that were organizing the fair... I promise we'll be done by quarter after, uh, maybe. Um, they said, all right, well, um, so we have this great basin. Why don't you build a replica longship? And we'll tell people about Leif Erikson. Just don't mention it too much because it's not the Erikson exhibit. It's the Columbus exhibit. 
But they built this gigantic thing. If you had a ticket, you could go in. There was a giant restaurant staff. Smaller, but still existing today, that's the Norwegian exhibit. Okay? And they did the design in the design of a Norwegian church from the Middle Ages. That was taken down. That's the one that's in Minnesota. Okay? Now, I we're going to be done in 10 minutes, and we're at the best part of the fair, the Midway, the Midway Plaisance. Uh, which is where all the stuff that you want to see, and after pretending to be an upstanding American citizen, you wanted to see. Yeah. And again, this is the midway. There's the Ferris wheel. Everybody in the world wanted to see the Ferris wheel. The previous World Fair was the Paris Exposition in 1889. It had that thing that Paris still has, the Eiffel Tower. Um, this one had an Eiffel Tower, too. It's just smaller. And the organizers of the fair said, yeah, well, you know, they had that Eiffel Tower. And everybody thought it was wonderful. So we need something really cool. And they dithered, and they dithered, and then they dithered, and they dithered. And then finally, uh, George Ferris came along. We'll see what happens with there in a sec. Oh, I, I want to make a point. You know, we were talking about clearly there was a lot of racism at this time. But one of the cool things about the fair is 27 million Americans got to meet people from all over the world. And you can see that here. These folks that worked at the various exhibits were out about. They didn't stay locked up all the time. So they were out talking to people. They were here as a, like an exchange student, except they were making some money. And you see the modes of transportation on the midway. You could have a sedan chair, uh, or you could have a camel or a donkey. As long as you had a ticket, okay, more tickets. Midway, the, the Java Theater, which was a cool place to go, on, like the Chinese Theater where you didn't really want to go, um, cost a quarter, which is about three, 375. Uh, the Ferris wheel was 50, 50 cents, which is about 850 today. Uh, 10 cents for the Ice Railroad, which was sort of a um, um, bob sled run that was kept cold miraculously by giant refrigerators. And then uh, this is the, for a dollar, which is $17, that would get you into the Austrian village, okay? How much were people making back then? Uh, the average worker in America was making maybe $330 a year. There's more coming up about that in just a, in a couple of seconds. So this is the Ferris wheel. Does it look like the stuff at the Brockton Fair? Yeah, but let's get the statistics. There were 36 wooden cars that could hold 60 people each. It was 250 feet tall, uh, and th those were essentially rail cars that were, were um, belted onto this giant piece of engineering. It was an incredible piece of engineering. Uh, in the course of the fair, and it, and it didn't start on the first day of the fair, it took them a while to get it fixed, uh, over 1.4 million riders out of the 27 million that came through. It cost uh, $400,000 in 1893 money to build the darn thing, uh, and it was ginormous. You would, uh, it took about 20 minutes to do a ride because they would rise you to the top which was 250 feet high, and they'd stop there so you could get a huge view of New York, and then it would come back down. To the best of my knowledge, no, there weren't bathrooms on the cars. So, yeah. Um, were the cars open? Uh, no, they, they, were, uh, they had windows that you could pull down, but they, you know. As far as I know, no one fell out. Uh, I think there was a suicide, but I don't think anybody fell out. And the other thing that people liked to see was all the strut work holding it together, uh, which was pretty amazing. All right. So the Ferris wheel was really incredible. Something even more incredible was lurking there, and nobody paid any attention to it. Yep. It was the running buffalo of Edward Moybridge. Moybridge was a photographer. Uh, back in the 1870s, he helped uh, Leland Stanford win a bet that uh, a horse's foot, when he gallops, uh, all four feet are off the ground. So what he did is he took a series of still photos and then found a way to make them work together, like this buffalo. 
That's actually a bunch of still photos who were printed on a disc. And by the way, Moybridge was, uh, if you're looking for the devil in the White City, he was a murderer. He got away with it. He killed his wife because she cheated on him. And, well, you know, Edward, we're in California, and that's not right, so you're, you're free. And besides, you get great pictures. He was a wonderful still photographer. So he invented this machine, which is the Zoo Praxeloscope. And basically, you can see right here, this is your circular plate. And it's a projection thing. This is real movies. It projects on a screen. You don't have to, you know, put your nose where a million other people put their nose. This projects on a screen. All right? You're limited by the size of your disk. So that's kind of a bad thing. And ultimately, that's what the undoing for this. And the other undoing is he took a whole bunch of pictures, all sorts of animals. Have you ever, do you know what a capybara is? He took a picture of a capybara walking around. It's a giant rodent from South America. He loved these animal pictures. So he had a whole bunch of them in his building on the Midway. And you could pay money and watch the animals run around. Unbeknownst to Mr. Moybridge, he had basically invented the modern movie. You may have heard the words, sex sells. <laughs> so some of his pictures were nude people doing things. Okay. This is a, a girl who is getting something thrown at her, and then it's her reaction. So she's getting something thrown at her. There's a story. She's nude because, well, sex sells. And if you turn this into a disc, you'd have a movie of a naked girl running around. That's Hollywood, right? OK, or at least the, you know, it's, it's the valley where the porn movies are made, um, which he can't, that's where he came from. But he didn't do this. He was out of business halfway through the fair because nobody wanted to watch his animals running around. They, wanted, <laughs> they didn't know about the naked ladies. They could buy a book with the still pictures and make their own, but they didn't. So Moybridge, unfortunately, is the father of motion pictures, but he didn't make any money at it. He gave up and went home to England. Um, I, I highly recommend searching out YouTube. There's a, there's a, a, a naked gentleman serving a tennis ball. And the jumping up and down part is really interesting. Um, we're almost done. So other things, this is the Java Village, which you bought a ticket for back there. And again, like the, uh, the lady from Ceylon, this young lady over here became very popular at the fair because she was so nice to the visitors. And this is a, a Javanese guy. Here is a bunch of puppets. You know, those shadow puppets are a big deal. And if you go to Borderland, there's a couple on the wall in the library because the uh, Ameses, when they went there, uh, got some of those. And uh, they also played um, gongs. Gavilan music, which was really interesting. Hard to understand in American point of view, but it sounded pretty. What didn't sound pretty was Chinese theater. Chinese theater, uh, real Chinese theater, a, a play can last for days. And every description I've read about it, this is the most horrible stuff. No one has ever watched, and no American has ever watched a, a Chinese play all the way through because they're so horrible. However, we know that Mr. Wolk himself would probably be there. Ron DeSantis would be there because these guys are in drag. <laughs> okay. So he had to check it out, I'm sure. Uh, China, just like Elizabethan England, didn't allow women to perform. So all the women's parts were played by ladies, uh, by guys, excuse me. All right, moving right along. We're almost done. This is hallelujah. This is what everybody wanted to, well, no. This is what everybody who didn't stay at the woman's exhibit had wanted to see. This is the Street of Cairo. So there were uh, uh, fake sword fights, fake, fake pole fights, camel rides, donkey rides. Um, the, met, the gentleman here became famous. He was a donkey boy. If you've ever read any Victorian novels of, of Egypt, donkey boys are like these, these, they were always trying to cheat you out of this, that, and the other thing. And he, he played the role to a T. Uh, yeah, and stuff. So uh, once you got over there, <clears throat> you would go to one of the theaters where the dancers were. 
Now for 1893, ladies, you may want to cover your eyes because I tracked down some real vintage photographs, uh, movies of these people showing you what all the controversy was about. And we have some more music here. So let's go to this next slide. Yeah. All right. So here are the dancing girls. They came in a variety of dancing girls. There were Arab dancing girls. There were Syrian dancing girls. There were even, as we'll see in a, in a moment, there were Jewish dancing girls. And there were Scottish dancing girls, but they didn't do the, you know, they did the thing with the swords. Um, the belly dancers. <laughs> Americans weren't ready for belly dancing. So one of the things you may have heard uh, in elementary school was this song. So we all, knew, at least in my school, we knew the song is they don't wear pants on the other side of France, um, which is probably true. Oh, stop it. Maybe not. We, we may have to suffer through that. So up above, this, the little picture is probably closer to what the belly dancing was at the fair. It developed very quickly historians of belly dancing have told us. And by 1895, this is what they were doing. Now watch. Okay, she's gonna keep going, don't worry. Hi there. Um, you have to, there, there we go. This is the first example of censorship in American film. Okay, all right. So that's what everybody was talking about. We're finished almost. John Ames Mitchell, the guy that uh, designed Unity Church, went to the fair. He was, got out of architecture. He didn't want to compete with Richardson. So he had uh, gone to France and uh, uh, developed his skill as an as a, uh, illustrator. And eventually, he founded Life magazine. So he got a gig uh, writing an article at the fair and basically said, if you're a millionaire, make sure you bring your million with you because the fair costs so much. And we have a guy here arguing over the bill at one of the cafes, okay? But he also, despite the fact that he was a little bit of a racist himself, um, on a, you know, not bad for the time period, but a little bit, uh, he really understood the advantages of, here's a guy, um, typically American, talking to two Arabs. And the, the caption is like trying to make a deal or something like that, okay? Should have worn the glasses, Barbara. Well, it's the sun shines oh, okay. On the All right. There's only two pictures left. So, three. Sorry, it lied. <laughs> you do. I'm doing good. Usually, it's not, it's not. All right. So, here are some of the folks you could meet at the fair. Now, you ladies wouldn't meet these guys because they're guys, unless you were chaperoned, and then of course you could talk to them. So, what we have here is an Indian person. What here? We have an Indian person which was probably a little tough for Americans to figure out at the time. There were cowboys to help them. I don't have pictures of them. Over here, we have the leader of the German band with that wonderful headdress. And we have this delightful Samoan gentleman here with the same headdress, pretty much. His was homemade. Over here, we have a Hawaiian. While he was away, we stole his country. Because in 1893, there was a revolution among the pineapple planters who uh, took over Hawaii, and so he didn't have a country anymore. It, it, was, it was the American Hawaii, and then five years later it became the territory of Hawaii and ultimately the state of Hawaii. So that's, that's him, he's a Hawaiian. This man is from the South Sudan, which some of us may remember the South Sudan had a lot of human rights violations uh, five to 10 years ago, and a lot of people in America did their best to try to help out with that. But he's playing a, he's playing a drum. What about the Italians? Here's an Italian right here. That's an Italian guy, very distinguished looking businessman. And there's his son, right? 
That, unfortunately, is not his son. That's an Apache Indian dressed up to pretend to be an American. Okay. Okay. But he looks very distinguished. I've, and then finally over here, just to show people haven't changed that much, because we know a person who is Armenian and clearly looks the same today. As, okay. The kind of skinny legs and the not so skinny other parts. So. so, if you didn't meet the guys, you could meet the girls. And let's go over there. Whoop, did I, get, did I skip? Yes, I did, sorry. Did I? Where are those girls? There we are. So here we have girls. Indian girl, Swedish girl, Romanian gypsy princess, who would tell your fortune, Samoan girl, Arab girl, Jewish dancer. The Jews that were pictured at the park were all Sephardic Jews from the Middle East rather than folks from uh, the ghettos of, of uh, Germany. Uh, there's a Scottish person dancing. There's an Eskimo lady. And there is a person from the Sudan. There was a place on the Midway with Congress of Beautiful Women. And they had like a beauty show every day. But it was people from all over the world. So that's pretty cool. You get to see how people were different. Kind of nice. So these were all people that you could meet. I'm saying, yeah, you might have been the biggest racist in the world, but you're going to bump into people that you've never seen before and you can talk to them. That's pretty cool. All right. So the last slide. Governor Ames, 1893, goes to the fair, comes back, decides he's going to donate a high school to the wonderful town of Easton. Do you think he's going to do one in Richardsonian style? Not him. He's cool. So we get the original Oliver Ames High School, which is in White City style. That's your reminder of what the White City was to us. It changed the way architecture was done in Easton. That's still there. Luckily, he had some uh, yellow bricks left over from his building of the addition to the State House, and it's yellow and not white, but still. There it is, okay. And that's despite the fact that the Richardson Company was still in business and 10 years after this building was built, they built the old post office building across from the hall, which still has the uh, Richardsonian arches and all of that sort of stuff. So I'm done, I'm sorry it went over 20 minutes, but there, there you go.